We're excited to tell you about Questions Worth Exploring, a new speaker series from Deseret Book. If you've wanted to hear more from some of your favorite all-in guests, this is your chance. On Friday, April 21st, Patrick Mason, Melinda Wilwright-Brown, and Rennell Hugh will all be speaking in Layton, Utah. You can learn more about Questions Worth Exploring by visiting DeseretBookPresents.com slash speaker dash series. To find ticket information for this event, as well as speaker lineups and dates for other exciting upcoming events with other beloved all-in guests like Barbara Morgan Gardner, Raina Aberto, Adam Miller, Steve Young, and Richard Turley. Again, that's DeseretBookPresents.com slash speaker dash series. I don't get to do many interviews in person these days, so I relish the opportunity to sit down with Utah Valley University President Astrid Tuminez. Immediately upon walking into her office, you get a sense of President Tuminez's personality, and I knew we'd get along just fine when I saw the Dolly Parton sticker on the back of her computer monitor. She walks in and immediately commands a room, despite being just four foot 11 inches tall. I learned following our interview that since arriving at UVU, President Tumenez has become a diehard UVU wrestling fan, a fixture at almost all of the school's wrestling matches. She knows all the wrestlers' names, GPAs, and their stories, and they know hers. As one senior on the wrestling team put it, a lot of times it's whoever wants it more. President Tumenez is an example of someone who wants it more, and we try to follow her example. She's a fighter. She's worked her whole life to be where she she is, end quote. That is the story you are going to hear today. Dr. Astrid Tuminez was appointed the seventh president of Utah Valley University in 2018. Born in a farming village in the Philippines, she moved with her parents and siblings to the slums when she was two years old, her parents seeking better educational opportunities for their children. Her pursuit of education eventually took her to the United States, where she graduated with a bachelor's degree in international relations and Russian literature from Brigham Young University. She later earned a master's degree from Harvard University in Soviet Studies and a PhD from MIT in political science. Before UVU, President Tuminez was an executive at Microsoft, where she led corporate, external, and legal affairs in Southeast Asia. She has worked in philanthropy and venture capital in New York City and is a permanent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She contributed recently to an essay in the Deseret Book publication every needful thing. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am honored to have the chance to sit down with President Astrid Tuminez today. President Tuminez, it is such a pleasure to be with you. I just want to start out with your childhood. You grew up in the slums of the Philippines, and your mom left when you were five. Is that right? Yes. So how does that impact you as a person still to this day? And also after that, your 15-year-old sister ended up taking care of Of you. Of all of us. Yes. So (laughs) what kind of gratitude do you feel toward her? Yeah, so I I grew up kind of thinking of my mother, uh, no, my sister as a mother figure. So first of all, the growing up in the slums, I I think there's nothing that peculiar about it. There are probably billions of people in the slums, even as we speak. What is peculiar about it is that I got out of it. So it was definitely a hard life. Poverty is nothing to be romanticized. So you grow up with a lot of indignity. You grow up uh, being exposed to death. You grow up being exposed to a lot of violence. You grow up also on the flip side, thinking about how do I help myself? How do I solve my problems? How do I get along with my neighbors so they don't kill me? (laughs) How do I learn from what I'm seeing around me? And, And to this day, I cannot fathom how my sister, who was really yeah, 15 or 16 at that time, really how, how she did it. You know, you have to do laundry by hand. There's no running water. You have to go to the well. 
uh, there's no drinking water. You have to line up at 10 p.m. at night with your bucket. And they're not even good buckets. You know, we used to use throwaway cans that used to be filled with something else. And then you put a wooden uh, thing across the opening and you nail it. Again, to this day, there are so many people living under these conditions. I think it's remarkable that my family got out of it. Right. And it is remarkable that we got out of it, certainly with some trauma, but not too much trauma. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was an amazing childhood. When I look back on it, it still is sometimes difficult to believe it. And when I've taken my children there, it's, it's completely foreign to them. And yet I say, hey, this is how mom grew up until I was 14. Right. Well, before we move on from that period of your life, I wanted to touch on something. And in, in a previous interview, you said that you lived under a circumstance in which if you were to make a single mistake, it felt like it could be fatal. Yes. And so you kind of lived in this fear of, of messing up, of making a mistake. For you now, you've said that you've learned that it's okay to make mistakes, but how, how has that evolved? I'm still a perfectionist, <laughs> and I still don't like making mistakes, and I still over-prepare, and I want my people to over-prepare because I think you never really get rid of that. I think, I think the, the difference is being more relaxed about it because, you know, I know what success is, and I also know there's a lot of safety net around me. But having uh, that understanding at a young age that I had no margin for error just gave me a lot of discipline that, you know, there was no safety net. There were no parents to catch me. I couldn't throw money at my problems. I had to ask myself, how do I navigate this world? How do I navigate this? And it's not even as if I was thinking those questions in an articulate manner. You're doing it instinctively as a child. Right. You're seeing kids drown. So you're, you're saying to yourself, I better not drown. I better not fall off the walkway during high tide. You're seeing uh, kids get sick, you know, with worms. And, and so you tell yourself, how do I avoid getting worms? And, and, and so all the time, you're just kind of figuring out this navigation and actually, that's a life skill because you see many adults today who still cannot navigate anything. And that's very worrisome. But, but you know, having no margin of error, you become smart at navigating. I mean, I even understood power at a young age when I was looking around. And, you know, Filipinos, you have to be kind of fairer skin, taller nose to, to, to be immediately kind of somebody and have a good last name because people know you're either wealthy or you're connected to politicians or it was, it's very stratified. So, so even navigating power at a young age where I understood I had none. Therefore, how do I join that team with power? Right. How do well, I gain that? How do I gain that? How do, how do I join that party? I'm, I'm obviously not part of that party at all and have, uh, you know, really minimal chances. And so, so, I mean, in hindsight, I can reflect on all this and analyze it. But, but as it was happening, it was just a question of survival and the day-to-day. -day. Absolutely. So when you were a little girl, you were how old when the nuns came and found you and your sisters? I was, I was five years old. Okay. And how, what do you think it was about you and your sisters? Obviously, there were many children yeah. that were living under those circumstances. Yeah. What was it about you all that you think attracted them to you and, and <laughs> led them to give you the opportunity of a lifetime, really? My older sisters tell me that it was because we were talkative and probably speaking with my mother. So even though my mother wasn't well-educated, I can, I can definitely see later on, I could see later on as an adult looking at my mother that she's actually someone who's very much a go-getter, very type A, kind of, and very restless, very hardworking. So I think they probably sense that in, in my mother also. And then, you know, when they, uh, so the nun, Sister Elvira Correa, I, I mean, I've seen her many times since, 
she always says that I was very talkative. <laughs> and she was the one who engineered the whole thing. And she, you know, she thought, this girl has something. This girl has something. And so, and so it's probably instinct. It's the spirit of God because these nuns are always praying and, and they're always, you know, they spend all their lives being married to Jesus Christ. That's how they are. And I can imagine that the goodness in their hearts and then the experience unfolding in front of them, you know, led them to have that insight that this is a family we should help. And, and again, that was just truly a miracle. I love that you attribute that to their being in tune to the spirit. I think that's amazing. Absolutely. So prior to that, you had never read a book. You were only five. So <laughs> I was only five. We had no <laughs> books and no radio, no television. We owned one book and was the Webster Pocket Dictionary. Oh my goodness. Had you, had you tried to read that? Not really, because I couldn't read at that point. I remember the, I had five sisters. So I remember the word sister was really important to me. And I knew some letters. And I actually remember knowing that it began with S-I-S. That's it. I didn't know what came after. Right. And I was really worried people would ask me to spell the whole word. <laughs> and then I'd be revealed as a charlatan you know, <laughs> who couldn't spell or read. So you get to the school and immediately you start devouring this opportunity to learn. The nuns gave you an opportunity that I don't think can be measured with any amount of money. What role did having that opportunity to gain an education, what did it do for your life if you had to sum it up? I think it's the pivot. So everyone, you know, almost all people in their lives will say that was the pivot where I either turned dark or this is the pivot where I turned light or that's the pivot when I discovered who I was. So it was the pivot for me in the sense that prior to being in that structure of a school and we were in the free department, which is where the poor people went. There was a rich department across the street and that's okay. where that, that was where kids with, with uh, maids and chauffeurs, you know, the wealthy children would be dropped off. Most of us walked to that, the free department. Going to school at Colegio del Sagrado Corazón de Jesus, College of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, was a true pivot for me. And that pivot meant discovering that there was a, a whole world called reading. There's a whole world called numbers. And, and you know, realizing that, that I honestly didn't know zero what was the difference between zero and 100? And I kept getting zeros from the teacher on my paper. And I just thought it was such a great score. So I would run home and get so excited. <laughs> and then, you know, my father had to explain, oh, actually, that's not very good. You have to have like the one and zero, zero. Is, that's the best score, not this one. Right. And I had a very strict teacher. I was called a visitor. They didn't put me in first grade because, again, because I was basically illiterate and they seated the, the kids, you know, first seat, first row, the smartest, last seat, last row, the dumbest. And I was in the last seat, last row. And what, what was beautiful was just, well, this, getting the skills was wonderful with this really strict teacher. And as soon as she found out that I could do things, her name was Mrs. Turiha, she would give me more and more and more. And, you know, she was moving me until I was in the first seat, first row. So that was beautiful, just getting the skills and knowing that I could read and I could understand. And then second, expanding that, you know, um, reading everything in the library. You, you couldn't get me out of there. And also I had no money for recess to buy peanuts or Coca-Cola. So I would just go to the library because it's very embarrassing when other kids are eating and you have nothing. And then the, the, the final thing was just learning to be competitive. I thought, I'm good at this. I'm just going to run with this. And I'm, I'm just going to be really the best at this. So discovering uh, competitiveness because I was so ashamed to be the worst. And, and you know, in, in my culture, shaming and naming is a good thing. <laughs> and in America, everybody gets a trophy. I mean, in Asian culture, they name you and shame you. And that has its good and bad effects. But I think the good effect for me was wanting to be competitive and, and that's been my modus operandi since, you know, just, oh, I don't know that. How can I learn that really quickly? And how can I be as good, if not better, than everybody else? 
I'm also a very competitive person. So we would, <laughs> we would get along well. President, I wanted to ask you about potential and about what it means to you in retrospect that these teachers saw you in that last seat, last row, and recognized your potential. What does it do for a student when they have a teacher that recognizes and sees potential and encourages that potential? Mm -hmm. I often like to say that no person is self-made. And when any person is arrogant enough to say they're self-made, they have done zero self-introspection. And so that ties in with your question about potential, who sees your potential, takes a risk in you, invests in you. So people have, around us have done this, that for us, whether that's our parents, you know, our teachers, neighbors, our bosses. And, and for me, what it means, especially now that I'm running a university, Utah Valley University, is open admission. When I applied for this job, I found that a little bit nerve-wracking that you accept Everybody, that, that's sort of the opposite of everything I've known. The, the main thing I've known is to compete really, really hard. And I knew that in high school. I knew that when I started at the University of the Philippines. And I really had to look at this model. And I became really quite intrigued by it and enamored by it. And now totally committed to it. Where the purpose of education becomes not exclusion, but inclusion. And the question to ask is not you know, who can we keep out, the riffraff, but how do you help develop every kind of human potential? So for example, when we say to someone, your ACT score is low and your GPA is low, don't apply. Basically, we're writing them off at the age of 18. And in business, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You know, you kind of look at all of the assets you have and I mean, in business, you write things off too if it's really not working. <laughs> But, but generally, I think uh, the idea of, of abundance or the idea of human potential has to be a little bit different, even the American way. And I am a, uh, you know, I am an American by immigration, right? I, I came here not as an American. I came here as a Filipino. But I think the whole idea of the American dream and the American way should be that human potential is treated with a sense of abundance, that people who were written off in high school or were bullied or didn't have good clothes or, you know, were hated by their teachers or their guidance counselor, why are we writing them off? And so that's where the idea of transforming that human potential through education comes in. It's very complicated when you're educating a very diverse university or a classroom where you are combining someone with a, an, a 14 ACT and someone with a 34 ACT or a 1.6 GPA and a 4.0 GPA. You really have to teach in a different way and you have to grow confidence. And so I feel strongly about it because I think investing in human capital is something that we should do. Yes, not everyone will go to Harvard or MIT where I did my graduate work, but who cares? Other people are smarter than I. The EMTs can save a life. The, the dental hygienists can save teeth. Who am I to talk, you know, with the kind of education that I had? So, so there are different intelligences and there are different skills. And I think it's using education, post-secondary education, to, and actually education from pre-K all the way to whatever people want to attain. I think we should live that more, more sincerely and more effectively and that we don't all become, you know, elitist snobs because that becomes quite boring. <laughs> and in America today, where uh, seriously, inequality in this country is terrible. And I grew up in a third world country. I know what that kind of thing does to people, to individuals, to families, to cities. You're going to have crime. You're going to need more prisons. Is that really what we want? Or do we have the courage and commitment to say we are really about human potential in many forms? and are willing to work with that human potential so that, that it can find where it needs to go, you know, to live a dignified and productive life. I want to lift everyone. I, yeah. I love that idea. President Jimenez, I found it interesting that you found the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints while you were in school where these nuns had taken you. How does that even happen? <laughs> Well, you know, in the old days, all the missionaries would go tracting. 
And almost all the missionaries at the time were from Utah or from, or from America. So all Americans. And the first set of missionaries that came to the slums uh, actually fell into the water. And it was one of them fell into the water. It was really filthy. And so that discouraged them from returning. But they left uh, our names, my family's name, in a drawer in the bungalow where they lived and which was also used as a chapel. They, they taught my oldest sisters, and, and I didn't join the church right away. It's funny, but I drank beer as a child. So did my sisters. And so, and so uh, for us, it's like, why would you change religion, you know, and then give up your beer? Mm-hmm. And of course, we're very close to the nuns. They, they were really our mothers and our mentors. And it was very, very tough to, to give that up. And I was so devout as a Catholic. I went to church. I went to confession every week without fail. I pray the rosary all the time. And um, so, so that was actually difficult. And I think I was second to last. My father was over, you know, two, three years. We all eventually, maybe over a couple of, of years, my father took forever, maybe four years to join the church. So I went through many sets of missionaries and I had a lot of questions. Even though I was very young, I was 10 years old, I had a lot of questions and I just loved that they, you know, they were teaching that I was a child of God, that I was as worthy as anybody. And growing in a culture like that, that was so socioeconomically stratified, and you grew up thinking you're nothing, it was such a liberating theology, if you will, to be taught that I was a child of God and that my potential was limitless. It's, it's totally radical. It's totally revolutionary. And to get a 10-year-old to believe that, she starts thinking she's unstoppable. <laughs> and so I joined the church and, and, and I think it was such a great influence in my life because it gave me a lot of aspiration, a lot of discipline, you know, the church programs, you know, to, the, to this day where my, uh, my youngest, for example, goes to young men. I think these programs are amazing. And you have adults who care enough to invest their time. Not everybody does it well. But those who do it well truly can change lives and be mentors and, you know, critical influence to the lives of young people. By the way, whether or not they stay in the church, someday they will remember that leader who said something to them or lived a certain way or spoke with compassion. They remember that. That's all in the brain. That's all in the memory. I think that's something that we often underestimate within the church is how much time people are investing. I often think if I could go back to my young women's leaders, I would thank them for, you know, taking PTO to go to girls camp. That's a big yes, deal. Yes. President Jimenez, I think about that experience that you had growing up in the slums of the Philippines and how it must have been so life-changing to learn that, like you said, about your divinity, that you were a child of God, and to be able to recognize that that was within you all along. You had all of these natural abilities and talents, but also just innately, did you did you have a sense that you were a child of God prior to learning about the gospel of Jesus Christ, or was that just mind-blowing to you? Well, certainly as a Catholic, I had a sense that I was a child of God. But, you know, a lot of it was very fear-driven. You're going to go to hell if you make bad decisions or you commit sin. It was very fear-driven. And and, uh, when I joined the church, there was certainly still a bit of being fear-driven. But suddenly the vista that opened completely was this vista of eternal progression, that I truly literally was a child of God. And so even though you fear judgment, at the same time, there was just a big rewarding side to it that was full of light, that was about progression, that was about learning from your mistakes and then picking yourself up again. And I think I really latched on to that. It certainly was not easy to always think in that sense because, you know, we always think about doing wrong things. And But I think as I have gotten older, that continues for me to be one of the most profound principles of the gospel of Jesus, Jesus Christ, that I am not my darkest moment. I am not my mistakes. I am not my foibles. I am actually already loved. I am actually already saved. I am actually already accepted for everything that I am. And, and, and that divinity, which I think 
ought not to be denied. We make it little. It ought to be writ large that, that we are already divine and we should really just be in awe of that every single day. Practically, how I applied that was really thinking nothing can stop me. Nothing can stop me because I, I already know who I am. And if I could just remember who I am, then, you know, I could keep going no matter what blows life would send my way. And we all know life will send terrible blows our way, but we are still children of God and we are worthy. I think that's why President Nelson recently has emphasized over and over again that idea of identity, mm-hmm. because when we understand our identity, that changes yes. everything. And not just for us. I think it's so important to apply that to everybody else, that everybody else is not the sum of their darkest moments or their sins or their sorrow or their grief. They are still full of light because that, that is the revolutionary idea. And I think that's what Christ taught. I completely agree. So, President, I, I would love to know, from there, you ended up coming to the United States. And you came, I believe some of your sisters were already Two here. Two of them were the already States. here. Yeah. And, and how did you make that decision to come? And then once you decided to come, you faced some pretty serious opposition in getting here. Talk yes. to me about the persistence <laughs> that that required. Yes. So, of course, I got into BYU pretty quickly. I had a scholarship at the University of the Philippines, and I had already gone, I think, three semesters. And I got into BYU. They didn't give me any academic credit, but they accepted me. So I was very excited. The, the major hurdle was really getting a U.S. visa. So in order to get a U.S. visa to study in the United States, you have to show that you own land or a car or a house or assets that will persuade the consuls at the embassy that you intend to return and you will not be liability to the U.S. government or the American system. And so I applied the first time. I, I got turned down. I was told, you know, you don't have any money. You don't have a bank account. You are liability. We can't let you into the United States. I applied again a second time, got the same story. And so for the third time, I thought I would fast for 48 hours. <laughs> Naturally. You know, I was, <laughs> I probably weighed 79 pounds at the time of thinking about fasting for 48 hours. I fasted for 48 hours and you have to stand in this long, long line, you know, at the U.S. Embassy, like for three hours until they let you in. And then you go inside and it was terrible. It was the same outcome. So I, I was ready to give up. But there was a family in, in my ward, beautiful Mexican-American family, the Gomez's, Fernando and Keta Gomez. And their daughter, Susie, was a very good friend of mine. And they were really kind of upset about this outcome because they thought that I should go to BYU and get an education. And so they actually went to the embassy and, you know, interceded on on my behalf. And because of that, I was able to get a visa. (laughs) And, And so the rest of that was just, you know, it opened the door for me to be in the United States, get get an even better education at BYU get mentored by professors who to this day are a big influence in my life and then you know go to Harvard and MIT so all of that just just one door opening one after another and getting help all along the way it, that's that's pretty remarkable beautiful so you come here to the United States once you arrive i imagine that there was quite the transition quite the adjustment <laughs> to american yes. culture what was that like for you Yes, the, the adjustment was easy in some ways and really difficult in other ways. It was very easy in that for the first time in my life, I had nonstop electricity, running water, you know, a nice bed to sleep on. And I lived with my sister and her husband in Orem. And I was just so excited that their apartment had carpet. And it was, it was not a very nice apartment in hindsight, but just that they had carpet and I would lie down on the floor and do my homework. And I thought, why doesn't everyone here get straight A's if they have carpet and running water and electricity? So, so that was the easy part. And, and some of the hard part is, you know, you, you don't have any mobility if you don't drive and don't have a car. And 
just adjusting to the whole way of life in, in the United States, a whole new diet, different people, and even some of my ideas like what are return missionaries like? Some of it, I was crushed by it because I, I just held them in such high regard. <laughs> and some lived up to it, but others were very disappointing. That's because, you know, when you are out in the field out there, you just think these missionaries are perfect. And I felt very short. Interestingly, that was one of my challenges. Like, I, I was so short and everybody's <laughs> so tall. And do I have to wear, like, tall shoes all the time? And finding that I had to support myself as well you know, getting a job, working, the maximum that I could work as an international student was 20 hours. So working a lot, taking a lot of credit hours, getting really good grades so I could have the scholarship. And it's very funny, I actually got a Lamanite scholarship, which is really funny because I went to the Lamanite office and I referenced Hagoth in the Book of Mormon. (laughs) And I said, he could have ended up in in Southeast Asia. There are a lot of islands out there. (laughs) And um, so they helped me with my books, and, and I, was, I was really glad. You know, one of the things I learned was that skill of navigating, again, back to the slums. I'm now in a new context. How do I navigate this? How do I ask for help? My mentor, Professor Gary Browning, who was uh, the chair of the Department of Slavic and Germanic Languages, I remember going to him for a job on my, in my very first week at school, and he needed a secretary. And so he had me take a typing test. I had never typed anything official before. I, I had probably seen an electric typewriter one time in my island. And here's an electric typewriter. I didn't know where to put the date or the salutation. So I failed that miserably. And he didn't give up on me. He said, why don't you go downstairs and take a spelling test? That's amazing. Of course, I was a a massive reader. You knew how to spell. I could spell anything. And so I I went and took the spelling test and 100% and and he hired me. And so so I was really glad I had those navigating skills, navigation skills, and I could ask. And also that there was somebody named Gary Browning who said, yes, I'll, I'll take a risk in you. I'll do it. And, and my whole time at BYU, I worked only for him the whole time. I love that story. I was actually going to ask you about that. So I'm so glad you told that story. (laughs) Yeah. So from there, from BYU, you ended up going to Harvard. Is that right? That's the right order of operations. And at Harvard, that is where you met your husband. Yes. And you've said that that was one of the most important decisions of your life was marrying the man that you married because of the way that he has empowered and encouraged you. Tell me a little bit about what that looks like in practice. Yes. So, you know, graduating single from BYU, that's an accomplishment. I had the same accomplishment. (laughs) (laughs) All my roommates got married and thought, man, what's wrong with me? So um, getting to Harvard and uh, meeting Jeffrey Tolk, my husband, uh, T-O-L-K, that's a critical uh, pillar, if you will, of my life. And I always tell my children the most important decision you'll ever make is whom you marry. It affects your gene pool. It affects your life, all aspects of your life. And um, what was funny with Jeff was when we were dating at Harvard, he was a senior about to start law school at Harvard. uh, And he'd also done undergraduate there. And I was a master's degree student. But when we got engaged, I don't know. I don't remember how this happened exactly. You know, he just kind of turned to me. We're walking in Cambridge and he says, you know, I'm not responsible for your happiness. And I was just so struck by that. You know, in my generation, I think we sold a myth that you just get married and, you know, the heavens part and you're going to be happy forever. And that's completely untrue. And, and I was, but that was my expectation that, you know, you got married and suddenly as a woman, you're all set for life. And he, um, when he said that to me, it kind of froze me in my tracks. It kind of shocked me that this man I'm about to marry just told me I'm responsible for my happiness. <laughs> but that was such a wonderful thing to say to me because I took it seriously. I'm responsible for my happiness. I'll navigate my own life. And, you know, because of that, and we were mutually very supportive of each other's education, of each other's aspirations. And my first biggest job was in the Soviet Union. And Jeff was actually in New York starting his 
career as a litigator in, in securities. And just the fact that we lived apart, but I would come home to New York every six weeks to say hello to him. I mean, that's, that's totally something most people didn't understand. And, and, and yet, the, yet that we had that commitment to one another and to supporting each other's dreams. And that's what I think is a secret. I always say a good marriage is one long conversation. If you have nothing more to say to each other and, you, and, and you're not interested in arguments or, hmm. or insight or, you know, some surprising idea, I think the marriage falters. And, and at least for me, and, and so this kind of mutual support and mutual respect for one another's dreams and one another's ideas uh, has really, really been important to my marriage. And no one's prouder of what I accomplish than my, hu- my husband, honestly. <laughs> He, he just loves it, you know? So I, I, I'm like, that's so important, especially because I did not have parents who, growing up who were always, you know, clapping for you. I get a medal in school and everybody had a parent and I didn't. For my graduation in sixth grade, I remember I was the salutatorian and my father was late because we were such an informal family. We grew up in the slums, anything went. And, and just having my husband be there to be my cheerleader, I think that's really important. And of course, again, as that's unfolding, I don't know that. I'm in my 20s. But, but again, as I look back, look, it's really wonderful to have someone cheering for you. And, and for me, that's my husband. Well, he himself accomplished great things in his career and, you know, really was a terrific partner for raising our children. So well said and, and so good to hear. I'm in year one of marriage. So that's really good, really good advice. You're in the honeymoon stage. That's right. Talk to me 20 years. Okay, okay, perfect. Well, I, I also wanted to ask you, you had kind of through a string of events, you ended up in a career that you yourself said was not a strength. Talk to me about that, about recognizing that sometimes we end up in a career path or in a job that might not be our strength, but we can still learn from that. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll step back from the question a little bit. Okay. One of the things that's really central to me ever since I was a child was the passage of time. I remember as a little girl just crying because the day was over and I'll never get it back. I don't know where that was coming from. But so to this day, I, I, I begin with that because I think careers are part of time. Careers are part of one life and you'll never get it back. You will never get the time that has gone. And so I've, I've always approached careers as it's just part of the one wonderful life that I have. And therefore, if something's interesting, even though I know nothing about it, I will go for it. So that's probably the reason why my career has been really varied, where I've worked in academia, in philanthropy, uh, on Wall Street, in technology, I uh, now running a university. It's always been driven by this sense of time. What else do I want to learn? What else do I want to know? And, and even though I'm ignorant in that subject, hey, I know 10,000 other things, and maybe they can teach me that. And I'll work really hard and learn it and prove what I can do. So, um, so, so that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the reason why I have had what I call a zigzaggy career. But at Utah Valley University, I find that everything I've learned in philanthropy, investment, academic administration, technology, uh, peacekeeping in the Southern Philippines, peace negotiations, is all, all a- applicable to a university because that's how diverse universities are, every aspect of running it requires this, you know, composite set of skills to to be able to see and understand what's going on. President, when you made the decision to come here to Utah Valley University, you were working for Microsoft. And you said prior to that, you had switched jobs every four to seven years because you would get kind of bored. Yes. But you were at Microsoft and you loved your job. Yes. So what was it that made you make that big decision to come here? So Microsoft is really a great place to work. I I think, in fact, that it was the best job that prepared me to become a university president, particularly given where we are today in the digital economy, the the fourth industrial revolution and so on. 
So, so the job happened in, in a somewhat haphazard way in that I wasn't looking for, for a job as a university president, but a friend of mine who was an adjunct professor, of, uh, who is still here actually, is an adjunct professor of art and design, was visiting me in Singapore. And I, I was really growing at Microsoft. You know, technology is an amazing field to be in. There's never a boring day. And the portfolio is so large that you'll never get bored. And my friend just uh, casually suggested, hey, you should apply for this job. You know, U UVU is looking for a new president. And I kind of dismissed it right away. I, I don't have any plans to be a university president. Interestingly, the thought wouldn't leave my head. And I call that inspiration. I call that the spirit. You know, <laughs> the, the, the spirit tells you, the universe is telling you, you should, this is something to explore. And so I looked up UVU and I was just shocked at how much it has grown and evolved into this amazing institution with big ambitions while, while it still carries within its DNA a lot of you know, humility, workforce orientation, technical education, bachelor's degrees, everything. And so I was really, really intrigued and, and I decided to apply. And, and the, the rest of it, as they say, is history. And, and I really wasn't sure how I would fit in. But the more I learned about UVU, the more I realized that I could use all of my skill sets here. And then the other question was really impact. So certainly in the corporate world, I could have a lot of impact. But, you know, at the end of the day, there are pressures in the corporate world that are a bit different in the academic world. I think in the academic world, there is a lot more space for you know, pure idealism, while at the same time, you have to be really hard-nosed about your competition and your resources and how you use them. So, so anyway, I, I came and, you know, it has not disappointed me in any way. I've been here for four and a half years, and I still feel that if I were just looking for meaning, you don't, you don't come to UVU for money, you come here for meaning. You come here for human potential, and day after day, it will deliver for you. And I think nothing is, is you know, more rewarding than that. Um, so, yes, I'm here and I love it and I have no regrets. Well, you've done a wonderful job. What would you say is your greatest hope for this time in your life, for your presidency here at UVU? Um, my greatest hope in my life is not is not just UVU. Obviously, I have a family, um, so you know my greatest hope actually, first and foremost, is for my children and my husband that they continue to pursue their dreams and and you know never stop having a really full and rewarding life. And for UVU, of course, we have many dreams here. I think we have a 21st century model of education that really works. We accept everyone. We have scale. And we do everything here from certificates, associate, bachelor's, and master's degrees. We're very pragmatic about the education that we want to deliver. We have faculty who are very committed to improving the human condition and to having social justice and, and really living inclusion, not that you feel sorry for those who are underrepresented, but you have an ability to use all of the resources of the university to lift everybody up. Because I think when they succeed, everybody becomes less tribal when there's more success. So we have many dreams in terms of having more students complete degrees, moving on into the world of work and life and succeeding as active citizens, as fulfilled individuals, and as you know, productive members of society. And we have ways to measure that. We have many other dreams here that are very specific to areas that we work in, whether that's engineering or the health professions or Mental health, we are a very big player in mental health, and that's, that's an issue in Utah and around the world. So whether you're talking about educating nurses, teachers, guidance counselors, substance abuse disorder specialists, we are doing all of that here. And 78% of our alumni are still here 10 years out. So the big dream is hopefully at my deathbed, I can look back at Utah Valley University or Utah, the state of Utah, and say, wow, I was a part of that amazing story whose ending I did not even see or is, whose further evolution I did not even see. You cannot walk up and down our corridors here and not feel energized by the students. That they just, they come in all shapes and sizes, all levels of confidence, and you have to help them open their eyes to their own potential. 
and navigate their lives and navigate education and fight for themselves because they're worth it. You know, I often tell students, you're not doing this for your mother. You're not doing this for your father or your grandparents or your boyfriend. You're doing this for you because you are worth it. No, no one can take that from you. If you believe you're worth it, nothing's hard. You'll get it done. And when you're successful and you, you help others. Well, I completely agree with you. I had never been on this campus until today and I walked through and it really was. There's a good energy and I'm grateful for the chance to have been with you today and appreciate your time so much. My last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? To be all in in the gospel of Jesus Christ for me is to wake up every day in awe of this world and of every human being, and to be able to open my eyes to everything good, bad, up, down, sorrowful, joyful, and to know that all of that is something that I need to embrace, and that I need to constantly become more Christ-like. So be in awe, embrace it all, and my job is to remember that the gospel is about developing a more Christ-like character. And I have to do that with both awe and joy. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are so grateful to President Jimenez for joining us on today's episode. Big thanks to KSL for their help with this episode and to Derek Campbell for his help with the audio as always. If you'd like to read more about President Jimenez's experiences, you can find an essay she wrote in the New Deseret Book publication, Every Needful Thing. Thank you so much for listening and we'll look forward to being with you again next week.